Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Perchuk. I'm the acting director of the Getty Research Institute. And first, I want to thank so many of you for coming out on the first truly lovely day of summer. <laughs> but we have a real treat in store for you, which is an evening of film, conversation, and subversive politics. The screening tonight of two films by the famed Hungarian director Gula Gazdag, both of which were banned by the Kadar regime in the 1970s in Hungary for being provocative, complements the exhibition Promote, Tolerate, Ban, Art and Culture in Cold War Hungary. This exhibition was a collaboration and is on now, and we really encourage you all to go see it, between the Getty Research Institute and the Venda Museum of the Cold War, and is on view through August 26th. That exhibition, co-curated by Christina Cuevas Wolf, resident historian at the Venda, and Azoda Poggi, who is here as assistant curator of photography. The exhibition features hundreds of objects from socialist Hungary. Here at the GRI, we contributed about 100 objects to the exhibition, including photographs, archival documents, and books from the great collection of Michael and Carol Simon, as well as individual things from the Harold Zeman papers and the Jean Brown collection. At the Venda, you can see these works alongside the Venda's diverse collection of Cold War era's artworks and ephemera. Together, these materials reveal the Qadar regime's cultural policy of promote, tolerate, ban, in which the government supported cultural production by those who echoed its ideology, while pushing to the underground, or even forcing to exile those artists who dissented. Our program tonight, like the exhibition, aims to demonstrate how artists have worked under authoritarian regimes that have controlled the contents, production, and distribution of art. To ensure a lively evening, and because we're always trying to do things better, um, we've reordered the program that you have in front of you. <laughs> so following the reception, we invite you all to join us for a panel discussion between Vera Mijoilic, uh, and two award-winning Hungarian filmmakers, Andre Hules and Gabor Kalman. At the end of their conversation, we will screen a second film by Gazdag, the 1974 Singing on a Treadmill. So we're fortunate to have Vera as our guide tonight. Vera, who was born in Sarajevo, moved to Los Angeles in 1992, in 2002, she founded the Southeast European Film Festival Los Angeles, known to many of us as CFEST. CFEST promotes the cultural diversity of Southeast Europe through year-round screenings and serves as an important site of exchange between Southern California and Southeast Europe. So please turn off your cell phones and join me in welcoming Vera. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you so much all for coming. It's really great to see a wonderful crowd on a beautiful day. They choose to be here with us to see the films and to participate in our conversation. I would like to thank you, Andrew and Isolta Pogi from uh, the Getty Research Institute uh, for this opportunity to share the films of Jula Gazdak with you, our audience. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this program, exploring some of the darker chapters of still very recent Eastern European history through a specific Hungarian lens of filmmaker Jula Gazdak. The more time goes by, the better his films get. This wonderful time travel will take us to the 70s and 80s, and I'm also pleased to have later this evening a conversation with the two witnesses to history, the award-winning Hungarian filmmakers and my friends, Andrei Hulesh, 
O'Hughes, and Gabor Kalman. I have long uh, been interested in exploring the layers of Eastern European cinema and its relation to the larger body of European filmmaking. What makes it unique? What exists only in Eastern Europe and nowhere else? What kind of thinking and perspective on things around them drives filmmakers in Eastern Europe to create such singular, immediately recognizable, crazy movies that defy our attempts to understand them? And do we really need to understand anything, or should just let go, come what may? Ernst Lubitsch, the famous Russian, German, Jewish emigre in Hollywood, known as master of innuendo, as much as for his wit, once famously said, I've been to Paris, France, and I've been to Paris, Paramount Studios. <laughs> Paris, Paramount is better. <laughs> it is this metaphorical space that is neither here nor there, the perpetual no man's lands that were immortalized in films made by filmmakers in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. You may find yourselves tonight searching for what seems lost in translation between our cinematic worldview here and their approach to storytelling over there. In this case, the there is Hungary during the Cold War era. However, both approaches to storytelling are rooted in a cinematic construct of a landscape, that specific surreal space found only in movies. The Lubitsch land in films of Ernst Lubitsch is seemingly more escapist than the harsh reality of Danistanovich, Bosnia in no man's land. Yet, while a significant time gap of 70 years stands between the two, the same emotional undercurrent inspires both, that of a space lost to transit lands and the whims of history. A space that an emigre kept recreating under the guise of a Hollywood comedy, and a Bosnian war contemporary immortalized in a black comedy of two enemies, locked in no man's land between the trenches. In my view, films by the masters of Eastern European cinema illuminate the theme of a doomed land where black humor is a means of survival, and hidden emotions are detected only on dangerous ground in the landscapes that are at once harsh and lyrical. Jula Gazdak, whose films we shall have the pleasure of seeing in tonight's program, is considered the most original Hungarian filmmaker of his generation. He also had another talent, the one for trouble. Most of his work was banned and was not allowed to be exported and shown outside of Hungary. Yet, he managed to create the body of work of enduring power, which carved a special place in the annals of cinema, with films that to quote, skewered Hungary's official dom, as Kevin Thomas wrote in the LA Times in 1987 on the occasion of UCLA Film Archive's tribute to Jula Gazdak. And just a few uh, info about uh, Jula's bio, from Jula's bio. Until 2015, Jula was a professor at the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, where he taught from 1993. He has served as the artistic director of the Sundance Filmmakers Lab since 97, and is there now. His numerous feature films include A Hungarian Fairy Tale, 1987, which won the Special Jury Prize at the Locarno Film Festival. Named one of the year's 10 best films by The Village Voice and the best feature film of the year by the Hungarian Film Critics Awards, it screened at 20 film festivals worldwide, including the director's Fortnight in Cannes. Gazdag's other films include Standoff, in 89, which won a special jury prize at the San Sebastian International Film Festival. Lost Illusions, in 83, named Best Screenplay by Hungarian Film Week. Singing on the Treadmill, which we will see in the second part of the evening, from 1970. The Whistling Cobblestones, 1971, named Best First Feature by the Hungarian Film Critics Awards, and Swap. He also directed many documentaries, including A Poet on the Lower East Side, a docu-diary on Allen Ginsberg, 1997, Hungarian Chronicles, 91, Berlinale Forum Entrant Package Tour, 1985, 
which we at CFES have shown in collaboration with the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust last year in November. The selection, 1970, the banquet in 1982, the resolution, 72, and the long distance runner in 1969. For the stage, Jula directed Candide, the bold soprano, the abduction from the Seraglio, the Tempest, Tom Jones, the Hot House by Harold Pinter, among many others. Jula Gazak has been a creative advisor at the Maurits Benger Film Institute in Amsterdam since 2002 and at the Scripps Station of the Berlinale Talent Campus since 2006. In 2010, Variety named Jula Gazdak one of the 10 best film teachers in the United States. The first film we will see tonight is his 1970 documentary, The Selection. It's a priceless send-up of the communist apparatchiks filmed as self-important rulers of other people's lives, speaking on the obligatory black telephone, their favorite prop. They are supposed to select a pop band to entertain wayward youth and attract them to the communist youth organization and draw them away from bombing on the streets of Budapest. The officials, however, prefer slow dancing and dislike pop. What follows is Gazak's wonderful satire with real-life players whose dialogue, now utterly ridiculous, once ruled the day. My favorite character is Mom, a shrewd band manager in the making. Enjoy. Welcome back. Uh, well, thank you for staying on. Hello. <laughs> well, we um, uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining us again for the second part. And we decided that we will just first start with a conversation which is always livelier and gives you an opportunity to share your impressions and ask questions and uh, um, you know, maybe share some of your experiences. So, um, so that's why we start with uh, um, this, you know, I don't like to call it a panel discussion, but it's a, a conversation with friends about cinema, about their experiences. They are the two witnesses of history. They're both Hungarian filmmakers. Andre Hules, or Hules on my right, uh, he is a filmmaker who lived in Hungary post-1956. Uh, he has made uh, films uh, and acted in a number of movies. He's a writer, director, actor, producer. Uh, he made uh, Torn from the Flags, uh, um, The Maiden Dance to Death, a beautiful movie, and is working on a wonderful new project called The Freedom Flight. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and he can certainly uh, say a little bit more about his background and his um, maybe uh, influences and people that made him decide to go uh, become a filmmaker. Um, and uh, Gabor Kalman is a Hungarian filmmaker who left in 1956. He was uh, living through that horrible period prior to 1956 that he wanted to share some insights about. Uh, but he also went back to Hungary several times after to uh, work on some other projects. And most notably, several years ago, he did a wonderful documentary film, uh, There Was Once, and it was shown at the festival which I run, the Southeast European Film Festival, and it won an audience award. Uh, so this is definitely uh, going to be a very interesting conversation um, and I have my talking points here because we had a great uh, coffee and croissants uh, at the farmer's market in LA a couple of weeks ago and I just wish we could uh, replicate that conversation for you, but we'll try, we'll try. And uh, if that doesn't work, then we decided that we will sing and dance for you. And, uh, <laughs> And actually, you know, Andre is a dancer, and uh, and uh, and uh, Gabor promised to sing some chardash for you, and so we will. Because I was a pioneer in, Yugos in Yugoslavia, so I sang in a choir. So uh, you never know what might happen at the end of this evening. Um, so these are my notes from uh, Gabor, who said that he'd like to start with. My own Cold War started when we returned to Kalocha in 1945. And there is a short story about the Soviet troops and my dog. So let's start with that. Let's start with a story. Come on. 
It's like a movie preview. You should <coughs> give away my story. Um, yeah, looking around this room and looking at the hair colors mainly, I think I'm one of the very few who actually lived through the Cold War. And I mean the Cold War not after 1956, but my Cold War started in 1945. And uh, I take the liberty to make this uh, discussion a little bit personal because I was there. And uh, in 1945, my parents and I, I was 10 years old, just survived uh, the war and the, the siege of Budapest and the Holocaust. And in uh, early 1945, around February, we went back to uh, our, my birthplace and we lived before the war in Kalocha. And we were, uh, I don't know how we looked like, but they were probably very skinny and dirty and very worn out, and we went there. There's only 120 kilometers from Budapest, but we took a train, we took a, a horse and buggy, and I don't even know how we arrived there. And we went to our home, and uh, we were barred there by Soviet soldiers with machine guns, and they were occupying the house. We could peek in a little bit through the windows, and we saw that on our parquet floors, Home, uh, they were horses, so the house was converted to a Soviet stable. And in the garden, there was our piano with uh, horses tied to the piano. So we had to look for a place, and we went from house to house where our extended family had homes, and we were probably the first ones, not probably the first ones, who returned because Budapest was a little closer to Kolocha than Auschwitz and some of the other places. So most of the homes of our relatives were occupied by locals and we were turned away. And finally we found a home, one of my uncle's home, that people were there and they let us stay there. So that was uh, not quite the Cold War, but close to it. Um, two days later, I was walking on the main street all by myself, I was 10 years old, and suddenly I found myself on a pavement. Somebody knocked me down and somebody was uh, viciously licking my face. And I looked up and it was our wonderful Vizsla uh, Sivar who jumped out of the neighbor's house and of course recognized me. And he was the first person who uh, 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 kind of welcomed us. And it was the first, um, it was neither a person nor an object, first thing uh, from our old lives. Uh, our home was empty, nothing. We, we had just a little bag when we came home. And of course I was overjoyed and uh, uh, took Sivar home. Two days later, I was walking the street with the, the same street with Sivar who was following me uh, without a leash because he was used to it. And suddenly uh, a Russian uh, military truck kind of screeched over to the pavement. One soldier got off, took off his belt, put it around Sivar's neck, and dragged Sivar in the truck and went away. And I was hysterical. I uh, cursed them out and I said, you filthy Russians, you took the only one thing we found, but nobody was listening to me because they were gone. So that's where, when the Cold War started for me. Thank you. For, well, the, um, so on that, um, we cannot probably imagine how it was for a lot of people uh, coming back to a place like that that they once knew as a, as a home. Um, but um, let's go for a minute to the, uh, just one other thing with you, Gabor, and then we will um, move on to some uh, stories from Andre. You mentioned that in um, 19, that if there were uh, 50 films were made in 1943, that Hungary had more than 800 theaters, the Royal Apollo was the scene of black tie Hollywood style premieres, and many directors, writers, actors emigrated to Hollywood. Uh, but then came the war and the Rakoshi regime, 
uh, and the culture was limited to propaganda films, Soviet plays, socialist, realist art. Um, and uh, however, as Gabor very aptly put, uh, they could not make Verdi or Mozart communist. So he became an opera lover. So can you just tell us a little bit about that on a, a more uplifting note? Well, just going back to a little bit of rewind again, to, to make it a bit more personal. <clears throat> uh, in 45, after we lost the dog, finally, slowly, my, we could move back to our home and my father started the lumber business, which the family ran for decades and decades and decades. That was 45. In 1948, the communist regime nationalized not only my father's business, they took away our home, and at the same time, they clamped down on the Hungarian film industry. Everything was nationalized, and that's when the Hungarian Stalin Rakushi took over. The opera story comes from the fact that to this day, I give Rakoshi and the communist regime great credit for, make me, for making me an opera lover, lover, lover because Hungarian culture as we knew it was almost entirely censored. Uh, the films where, uh, we talk a little bit about it later, were heavily censored and the production went way, way down. Um, Theater, um, I remember one very tempting uh, play which I didn't go to see was called 600 New Apartments. <laughs> so we didn't go to a theater. Um, music, Soviet music was nice. The Red Choir was, the Red Army Choir was nice. But there was the opera and there was Verdi, there was Wagner, there was everything besides uh, there was no communist propaganda. So very early, either, although I didn't always have money and we were standing up in the third balcony in Stanley Groom, but I became a, a great opera lover, which is, I thank the Cold War for it. Great, well thank you for that. And uh, Andre, so you're a little bit younger than our dear friend here, Olivia, <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, exactly, so the, uh, what was your, um, how did you become uh, enamored with movies or stage acting and especially dance? Tell us about your love affair with dance and, and then that translated somehow into movies and stayed together, it's like a happy marriage. My goodness. Uh, I, I, I didn't have a love affair with dance. I, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I did a dance film, but uh, uh, it was not uh, for the love of dance. It was because dance is another language that can express things without words. And um, words are very precious and uh, very easy to censor. And. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, watching this movie too, it just reminded me of how the culture separates uh, when a ruling class speaks a different language than the people who are being ruled. Whether it's effectively, and Hungary has a long tradition of that because we were under Turkish occupation and uh, German occupation and, and uh, the ruling class always spoke a different language. Uh, even God spoke a different language because the mass was in Latin. Uh, and the communist system was not that much different because the, they very quickly developed their own language. And these people in the film we just saw spoke that language that had really very little to do with reality. And uh, so for me, in the dance film, uh, dance was and music, opera, uh, were uh, ways of expressing yourself that you couldn't censor. I mean, how do you censor a dance move? How do you censor uh, a melody? And uh, so the entire culture uh, retreated to communicate with winks and nods. So we would do Shakespeare. And I went to Moscow, and they played more Shakespeare in Moscow than in London. <laughs> and. Uh, because you could show Richard III and everybody knew who you were talking about, but it was not said. And therefore, they had a very interesting censorship system for the theaters. Um, I, I used to work in the theaters in Hungary when I started. And 
uh, we had an official from the ministry who came into to our class at the academy <coughs> and, and announced to us that there is no censorship in Hungary. And uh, we nodded, of course, and winked. And uh, they, they said, well, so what happens uh, if you want to do a show that you perhaps don't like? And he said, well, you have to submit your program for the next year, and then uh, the ministry will look at it and, and approve it. And uh, if they find that the balance is not right, like, for example, there are too many plays about the, the, the power or the, the authorities, then, then we advise you to change that balance. And we said, and what happens if uh, we want to present something that you advise against? Well, of course, you can't do that. And one of the other things that's interesting for me is how these uh, habits don't go away if you change the system. You can change the system, but you can't change the population. Um, Back in, at the theater, the National Theater of Seged, where I was directing, we tried to put on a show by Janusz Glowacki, a Polish playwright. And the title was uh, The Train to Nowhere. It was an absurd play, which, uh, which absurd is, is a perfect uh, expression of what, how we felt at the time, because it felt like nothing makes sense. So we submitted the play, and. I was invited to the party secretary's office, and uh, they said, it's a very good play. Really very nice. We enjoyed it tremendously. It's really funny. Uh, I think it's culturally valuable. Um, it's just one thing. Uh, why can't this train go somewhere? <laughs> and it doesn't have to go to Moscow. It can go to Paris. New York, wherever you want it, just go somewhere. <laughs> and already back in the, in the, after the change, I was doing the Maiden Dance to Death, which is about uh, two brothers, one of them who stays in Hungary and one of them who is kicked out of Hungary during the communist system, and 20 years later he comes back. <clears throat> and uh, it turns out uh, that the other brother basically reported on him, and that's why he got kicked out. And then they sort of tried to make up and do a show together, which is the Maiden Dance to Death, based on a ballad of that girl who was danced to death by the devil. And it's basically the whole thing is about how, how do we compromise and, and basically give away our souls without knowing when it happens. And uh, I was called into the curatorium, which was the same office that decided which movies uh, get supported and which not. And uh, there was a five-member uh, committee, and they said, it's a beautiful screenplay. I really love it. It's, it's, it's funny. Uh, the dance, I can see the dances as it's written down on the page. Uh, the, the relationships are beautiful. The family, really lovely. Um, it's almost too much of a good thing. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Said, well, it's an entertaining film. It's, it's, it's for, the, for the people to have a good time. Why mix politics into it? <laughs> Why couldn't that brother just leave to find his fortune far away and then come back and have a reunion and then they can do dances? <laughs> and, and I said, well, it would be just about like doing Hamlet without the father's spirit. <laughs> uh, and, and, but this was already after communism. So it's interesting how once you go that way, once you, once you start to, to censor, if you want, censor your own thoughts, uh, it doesn't go away with the system. Well, th uh, thank you for the story, and uh, we d talked in the, in the, during the break and, and many times before about the, uh, this need that is now in our DNA in Eastern Europe that we, uh, it's a double speak. Uh, we 
love to speak between the lines. We uh, use the innuendo. We are uh, just, uh, you know, having gallows humor. Um, in, and that seems to be a staple uh, that is not going away anytime soon. No, I, I think uh, jokes are an essential element of uh, Eastern European and, and I guess oppressed cultures as well. But I know that anytime something horrible happened, within minutes there was a slew of jokes about it. And uh, one of the biggest jokes for me is that uh, the AVO, which was a secret service, and the, one of the heads of the AVO in, in a regional city in Seged, in southern Seged, who started the conceptual trials in 1947, uh, became a comedian. He was one of the leading comedians of the country. And everybody knew, and he was making jokes, and sometimes they were funny, but, but that's just, the whole thing is, is all related. Uh, somebody needs to turn off the phone. And uh, Gabor, um, you were uh, saying something about how you discovered American films at the embassy. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Sort of. Um, again, I just want to emphasize that uh, although Andrea and I and Vera are exactly on the same wavelength when we're discussing uh, this dialogue here. We were really completely in, in, in concert with everything we're saying, except I want to emphasize that the era I'm talking about is uh, the first 10 years of the Cold War where these people were barely born or not even born. Um, and I'm sure there's a few people here who remember that and I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, but I just want to paint a little bit of a background of the literal terror under Rakushi, that how you didn't dare to listen to the radio, particularly the only radio that gave us news was the Voice of America or, uh, or Radio Free Europe. And if your neighbors heard over the wall that you were listening, you could be deported, you could be jailed. Um, there was absolutely no areas of life which was not under this, this very severe uh, uh, depression, very severe uh, censorship, not just films and the arts, uh, our, our daily lives. And we lived in terror. Uh, some, the, the classless, Communist society was divided into four classes. <laughs> the peasants, the working class, the intelligentsia, and the class aliens, which I was fortunate enough to be called. And the class aliens were the enemy of the people. And they really were. They couldn't get jobs. I couldn't get into a university. And uh, a little bit later, some of these families were deported to the countryside for some reason. They think it was a threat to the national security. Uh, I think it's mostly because they needed more apartments to give it to other people. So going back to American films, as I said, we were totally deprived of any Western culture or even Hungarian culture, which didn't fit into the communist formula. Um, the films they played in the theaters were either Hungarian films, which were all propaganda, or Soviet films, which were the templates of the Hungarian propaganda films. So it was almost impossible you go to go to a theater. We heard, uh, we, my friends and contemporaries, that the U.S. Embassy on uh, Sabacak there was going was showing American films every week, I forget which day and what time, and they were wonderful. And we heard some of the names we recognized, but uh, it wasn't that long before we actually good, did see American films. So I and some friends decided to go there. We got about a block away and we got cold feet, particularly when we recognize this man across the street with a camera. And we decided not to go. It didn't keep us from going the next week and the next week and the next week 
and I never really got inside until 2014, four years ago, when I made a film and the U.S. Embassy in Budapest invited me and that was the first time I entered, not only as a shy, terrorized Hungarian student, but as a, an award-winning American filmmaker, and it made a, a great difference. Um, Andre, uh, you lived through the, the Qadar years uh, after 1956. Um, there is, you know, the part of the, the, the project w uh, between the, Get the Getty Research Institute and the Wendy Museum is this, you know, the, this funny contradiction of, you know, uh, promote, tolerate, ban. Um, some films were made, some people were able to make movies, some were banned, but then they made another film. So there is this contradiction about we have, that's the, you know, the time when um, Jula Gazdag, of course, was making his movies. But there, that's also the time when Miklos Jancsa was making films, Istvan Sabo was doing the movies, Marta Messarosh was making films. So, um, and some of these films were about uh, 1919 rather than the, the, you know, so maybe that was another subterfuge and trying to tell the stories by talking about another t uh, time. But how did you experience this contradiction of here are some filmmakers able to make movies, how did you feel about that? Did you feel that eventually you will have an opportunity to really spread your wings ever or not? Um, well, as I said, I was in the theater, so I, I was working all the time. I, I was not a, they, they, they very strictly separated the movie makers from the theater people, so I, I, I didn't experience personally that part, but it was a very interesting process because the Qadar system was uh, much more of a soft uh, dictatorship and uh, they like to pretend that there was no censorship whatsoever. They like to claim that there was no censorship. And uh, the academy turned out regularly uh, classes of, of filmmakers that the industry could not really support. And uh, it was really a, a lot of times you had to earn your way into the system. And, you mentioned Yoncho. Yoncho has made a number of uh, uh, pro not almost propaganda films, uh, but they were very much in the in the party line. Short films, long films. The the real May first, which is the big party uh, holiday, until he could earn his way into uh, making the the. Uh, really idiosyncratic and, and very interesting films that he made. Uh, there was uh, Peter Bocho who, who turned out a film every year like clockwork and one was worse than the other. And uh, suddenly in the mid 70s we found out that there was a movie he made 10 years ago that has been sitting on a shelf. That's one of the most brilliant uh, uh, parodies of, of the whole communist system called The, the Witness. And, or there was Istvan Sobo, who you probably heard about, who won an Oscar for Mephisto and was nominated for an Oscar for The Father and was really one of the premier filmmakers representing Hungary in the world, who turned out to be an informer, uh, who was pr pretty much the only person who could make films about the 56 events, as it was called in Hungary at the time. Um, and he had to earn it some other way. So there was always a, a price to pay. The, the, the piper had to be paid to, to make, uh, make your films. And uh, that sometimes it wasn't enough. And, and the other interesting thing is that one would think that the propaganda machine uh, had a separate uh, source of talent. And it did not. The best uh, composers were making propaganda songs and, and propaganda films and, and so forth. So it, it's, it's a very uh, unholy alliance uh, that people had to make to survive and to create something. And what about the dissidents? Well, uh, everybody was a dissident to a certain degree. It's just the question is how much. Um, 
I mean, some people were more hardcore and they were uh, either completely silenced or, or put out of the country. But I don't know what the difference is uh, with uh, today when Andy Vina is in Hungary and Tarbela is never making another movie. So um, I, I guess that's, uh, yeah, that's part of the, part of the picture. Um, Gabor, uh, you're a Holocaust survivor, and uh, your film there was once was about uh, Kalocha and the professor there, teacher, who um, starts the journey of discovering what really happened because her students and pretty much everybody else doesn't know about it. Uh, so this uneasy relationship with the past, especially with these pockets, the shtetls, and you know that were once. Uh, all over Eastern Europe that disappeared. Um, so you are one of the people that preserved that memory for us. So tell us a little bit about the making of this film, how hard it was for you to go back, and what do you think is uh, the relationship of the people there today with that past? One little collect, uh, correction. Uh, shtetls were, um, if anything, Eastern Hungary, and mostly in, Euro in the Ukraine and... Uh, uh, Poland, Hungarian jewelry were uh, as assimilated as the German jewelry, and this particularly town, Kalocha, was uh, a, a bishopric center and a Jesuit uh, educational center, and the Jewish population was very much integrated into the town. Nevertheless, there was a Jewish population, about 500 Jews lived there, um, they were all taken away, and uh, only less than 100 survived. But Shtetl, no, I didn't even know the real word until I came to this country. Uh, but that's just a little nuance, but it means a lot because describing the, the background. The film came, uh, by that time I left Hungary in 56, and uh, so I never made a film there. I was a university student there. <clears throat> and. Uh, I became a filmmaker, I became an academic, I started to make some award-winning films, etc. And then one day I received an email from an unknown person from Kalocha, introducing herself as a high school history teacher who was doing research on local history for her master's thesis, and she discovered that used to be a Jewish community there, which not only doesn't exist, didn't exist then, this was in 2008, but most people didn't remember, or she hinted didn't want to remember. And uh, she found my name, interestingly enough, on the, what is called the death list, or in Hungarian, the Yarosh list. Yarosh was a minister of whatever culture, or whatever. Uh, and he actually collected the list of all the Jews uh, supposed to be exterminated. And uh, my seven-year-old self was on the list. Uh, my email address wasn't listed, but uh, this teacher was diligent enough to track me down. And she said she's trying to find survivors who she could interview for her thesis. Would I be interested uh, in helping her. And then started a correspondence and talking on the phone, and it just happened that in 1994, uh, I was a recipient of a Fulbright uh, uh, Fellowship to go and teach uh, film at the Hungarian Film School. So I said, I instantly, not instantly, because there was, as I said, there was a little bit of correspondence and talking, but I, uh, without any hesitation, I asked her if she would be willing to be the subject of a film I want to make about her, which was totally the opposite of whatever I practiced or certainly taught before. I always told my students that, you know, first you have to have research and a script and money in the bank, otherwise don't even pick up a camera. Well, I didn't have to do research because it was part of my life. I didn't have a penny to my name, but that was an opportunity to do it. And uh, she said yes. And two months later, arrived there, and I had a Hungarian film crew waiting, and we started shooting. Her name is Junji Mago, 
and she turned out to be an incredible, wonderful woman who not only was doing research on this um, almost extinct but non-existent community, but as she was gathering information, uh, she was share sharing it with her students in her history class uh, every week. And uh, we filmed there for a couple of weeks. And uh, then she decided that she wanted to do a memorial for uh, this community who didn't exist. And she organized it. And a year later, we went back and some of the survivors who came back from all over the place, uh, the other countries, from the US, from Canada, from Israel. And there was this very touching, beautiful memorial. And while uh, the memorial was going on, in uh, most of it in the Jewish cemetery, which was in the ruins, the Nazi party of the newly organized Nazi party, the, the Magyar Garda, uh, held a demonstration and a very openly uh, uh, anti-Semitic rally in other parts of the town, which is also part of my film. So how it felt to go back, it was very interesting. I, throughout the whole thing, I felt like two different person. The survivor who returns to the place who, where I was literally uh, excluded and chased out and escaped, which wasn't very good. Uh, the other hat I wore was the, the U.S. filmmaker who is making a documentary about this incredible woman. And uh, somehow I managed to do both. And when we finished shooting, I remember I had a small crew from Budapest. We were in this van and I was in the back, probably slightly preoccupied and exhausted. And somebody from the crew asked me how I felt. And I, I couldn't even answer. It was, was a very difficult thing. But uh, I made the film, and the film won awards here. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, first it played, I was invited by the Library of Congress, then uh, the the State Department in Washington, then the U.S. Embassy in Budapest heard about it, and they invited me and sponsored me, and we toured the country, and it was a tremendous feedback and recognition. And in Hungary, I think echoes of the Cold War, at least that's how I felt, it was not censorship, nobody banned it, but zero. I interviews here with magazines, radio, everything. You know, it's quite a bit, I think. So how I feel about it, I feel good about it now. Uh, by the way, we would like to invite you also to, uh, you know, ask any questions and uh, because we want this to be as interactive as possible because you may uh, have some things on your mind that you, or things that you would like to ask our two wonderful guests. Uh, so please feel free, go ahead and, uh, 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 Andre, uh, going back to uh, Torn from the Flags, how was your experience making the film, um, talking to people, what was your impression, how that formed your, um, the picture in your mind of that period? And, and also, what did you ex feel that people were sharing, and especially what they were not sharing with you, what they were withholding, uh, so, on, on both of those, and, uh, you know, and right. how did you feel uh, while you were making the film, and how you came out of it? Yeah. And what uh, kind of a well, lesson? I, I, I was asked uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the Hungarian uprising was in 1956, which was sort of a, a watershed moment in the uh, uh, communist movement, or just how Eastern European communism was uh, viewed in the West and, and also in the East. And uh, the anniversary came up in 2006, the 50th anniversary, so uh, a lot of films were made for this anniversary. And when I was asked, uh, I said, well, the only thing I want to make is a documentary, a real documentary, where 
no, no commentary, no political standpoint. Uh, just let's go and find out what happened. So we talked to everybody. We talked to the people who were fighting on the street. We talked to the Soviet uh, soldiers who fought them, the secret uh, service people who were catching and torturing them, heads of states uh, on all sides, the biographers of Khrushchev, the biographer of Eisenhower. We dealt with, the, we started the story in 1945 at the Yalta Agreement when Eastern Europe was given to Stalin. We ended the story with uh, uh, the Soviet troops withdrawing from Eastern Europe. So to get how we got there and what were the, the repercussions, we conducted about 300 hours worth of interviews uh, all over the place. We dealt with the Suez crisis, which happened at the same time, what happened in the, in the UN. Really tried to cover the whole gamut of things. <clears throat> and the conclusion that I came away with were two. One of them was that we couldn't find the villains. None. It was everybody we talked to, including the Secret Service torturer. Everybody was doing the best possible thing, the most honorable thing they could possibly do in, under the given circumstances. The other conclusion I came away with, that everybody was lying. And not just the people who were uh, so supposedly guilty, but including the historians, including the biographers. Everybody was twisting the facts. Everybody was uh, toning somehow the stories to fit their image of what's happening. And uh, so finally what we ended up doing was we just gave the interviews one after the other, uh, obviously with a lot of uh, footage uh, uh, that was shot by Vilma Zygmunt and, and Laszlo Kovács, and just put them in contrast. So for example, the, the siege of the party headquarters was stalled by two people who were actually shooting at each other. And, uh, and we didn't leave out the, the obviously fake stories, like the guy who was telling us that uh, he shot down 50 Soviet tanks in 10 minutes all by himself. <laughs> and, and the less transparent stories as well. But, but the interesting thing is this collective psychosis that, that uh, sits in, in people's minds. And the other interesting thing is how it was received. We, it was an American sponsored film, so we didn't get any support from Hungary, from any Hungarian party. We tried to make a collaboration with the uh, television station, said we asked for a studio to do interviews in, and they said, well, we give you a minivan and a makeup person, and we want final cut. So we said, thank you very much. And uh, the interesting thing was that 56 is still uh, a very, very alive, sore on, on society's conscience. And everybody, every political party was trying to use it to some extent to their own advantage or to explain themselves or to be against something. In other words, you could not make a film that would suit anybody. And since we tried to be really just staying with the facts and staying with the stories, nobody wanted the film. I was there a couple of years later, it was never distributed in Hungary. It won awards all over the place. And even, even though there was not a single film made in Hungary, there were over 100 films made for the anniversary, none of them were as expensive and as complete as, as ours or as exposed uh, Edwards. It was never uh, uh, distributed there. In fact, I was there two years later with another film and they had a, a conference of uh, documentary filmmakers who were bemoaning the fact that there is not a single film made that has covered the entire gamut and not just consisted a couple of interviews on, on people who were in various corners. Um, we have very little time left, but perhaps we can... Uh, no time left? Well, I would like to thank these two wonderful guests. Thank you so much. Thank you.
I hope this is just a, an opportunity for you to explore and, uh, and perhaps we can have some more you know, screenings and events like this and conversations with other guests. But uh, the film we are going to see is Singing on the Treadmill. And uh, uh, it is a, you know, a film very different from the one that we saw. First of all, it's a feature. And uh, it is a film that is very uh, intentionally campy. Uh, it is a film that um, you know, might be um, reminding you of the movies of the 70s and 80s in Europe, because it has a little bit of that Fellini-esque uh, uh, you know, um, abandon. But it's, it stands in a, in a different category all of its own because it is sort of a parody of the operetta genre, which was uh, a beloved genre of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Um, it turned out that the communists embraced it as well. And actually, the first film I ever saw in my life, every time, the first time I was ever in a cinema, was a very kitschy version of The Student Prince. Not, unfortunately, the Lubitsch version, the silent one, but the one from the 50s. That was a Technicolor movie. And I was fascinated by it, and the songs, and all of that. So for some strange reasons, these are the contradictions that I think we can come away with after the, an event like this, and the whole program that the, uh, that the, the Getty Research Institute and the Wendy Museum put together, is that you know it's this contradiction. It's not it's not easy to label anything and to explain, uh, you know, oh, it was, uh, you know, the Cold War. There, there are so many layers to this, like a Russian doll. As you, when you start probing, you just keep going, and, and there it is, the rabbit hole. So it's a, it's a film that I hope you will, um, I won't say enjoy, but you can enjoy uh, the style and the abandon and, uh, you know, how he plays with, uh, with the subject. And I wish I had my, um, I will just quote, to, uh, because I did uh, look up some reviews, American reviews, that I found interesting. I hope you will, too. So this is very short. So the, um, the New York Times in 1987 called it a frolic with an edge, a delicious romp. And Kevin Thomas in the LA Times that singing on the treadmill is a corrosive musical fantasy, description-defying bizarreness that skewers kitsch taste, and that the film's many political and cultural references may remain obscure to most non-Hungarian audiences, but Jula Gazdak's protest against the folly of attempting to regulate human nature is crystal clear. So I will leave you with that. Uh, so sit back and uh, just join uh, uh, the bizarreness of the singing on the treadmill. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> 